Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Aidan Riley, who has been a great supporter on, and participant in our National Day for Japan in Ireland called the Experience Japan Festival. I can see some regular um, attendees of Jap Japan Fair, and um, I know um, you, you also are very familiar with the Experience Japan Festival which is annually held in April on the grounds of the family house in Phoenix Park. And we are hoping next April, next year, we'll go back there. Aidan O'Reilly, um, O'Reilly Sensei has been studying martial arts in various forms for over 20 years. He completed a master's degree in military history and strategic studies in 2009, and has given numerous talks and presentations on an eclectic range of topics at a wide range of events. In 2012, um, Aidan Sensei was introduced to one of the few legitimate examples of Koryu in Ireland, literally old school martial arts from Japan. Aidan Sensei's interest and understanding of this subject matter has continued to expand um, since this fortuitous first introduction back in 2012. So he continues to train and learn to this day and frequently travels to Europe to train as well, build better connections to the wider European Koryu community. Aidan is a member of the Koryu Budo Seifu Kai, based in Switzerland, which I didn't know, um, and of whose tutelage he studies Tenshin, Shoden, Katori, Shinto Ryu. He is also a member of the Shuto, Shutoku Kai, I'm sorry, I can't do the Japanese anymore, Shutoku Kai through the Belgian branch of Jiki Shin Kageryu Naginata Jutsu, with whom he trains as diligently as possible also. Aidan Sensei is so humble. Um, and today he is appearing um, in Furu Keikogi um, for today's session. So um, without further ado, I will now hand over to you, um, Aidan or Aidan Sensei. And um, so you will talk for roughly 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have a QA session. So please use the QA function um, at the bottom of the screen as usual to submit your questions. The virtual floor is yours, or Aidan Sensei. Thank you very much. Thank you now. Um, it's always nice to hear such kind words about myself. Um, you'll have to excuse me while I'm on my, uh, my in, in my full bomber command attire at the moment. Um, I am I, I am wearing my full uh, Keikogi and my Hakama. So, Oop. and or my or, or, or my party here, as, uh, as as sometimes I refer to it. Um, so I'll jump right into this, uh, and uh, obviously there will there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, and I will have I will have a few opportunities to ask you some questions over the course of the over the course of the presentation. Okay, um, so with that, so what you should see there is one of a number of very uh, beautiful prints that I managed to find covering uh, the topic that we'll be to talking about today: Katori Shintoryu, swordsmanship in an age of battle. Uh, we'll jump right into it now. Uh, we'll answer the first and most prominent question. And I know that uh, now San has been very, very kind uh, in his words about me, but I'll just uh, talk about myself a little bit more. Uh, where are you? Go on, there we are. Okay, so who am I and why am I here? The short answer to that is nobody important. Um, I'm a member of, as I said there, the Koryo Budo Seifu Kai, as well as the Shuto Kukai in uh, Tokyo. Um, I'm a practitioner of, a practitioner rather, of two, what we would refer to as old school martial arts or ko Koryu. Uh, one of them is Tenshin Shoden Katori Shintoryu, and the other is Jikishin Kagiryu Naganara Jutsu. Today, we will be talking about Tenshin Shoden Katori Shintoryu uh, with time i hope i will have the the permission and the and the patience of my sensei that you will allow me to talk a little bit more about naganata it's another subject that is quite dear to my heart um i have a master's degree in military history and strategic studies um and this i or at least i like to think uh that it allows me the scope to be able to talk about elements beyond the simple combative areas of of martial arts simply beating another opponent with a sword um, and I have been involved, as, as has already been said there, in a number of demonstrations uh, but at the Experience Japan Festival with their kind patience and, and permission, for which I'm always thankful. And I'm looking forward to uh, taking part in again in the future. Um, so with that said, um, we'll start talking about the subject at hand, 
which is a martial art known as Tenshin Shodan Katori Shintoryu. Okay, um, we'll refer to it as I might call it Katori or Katori Shintoryu or a number of other things. But if you hear the word Katori, that's what I'm talking about. Um, the the name itself translates to the divinely transmitted new school of the Katori Shrine. Okay, so I believe that is the Katori Shrine in the in the background. Um, the, the school itself follows a number of other schools of the age in that it is it has a certain mystical element as to how it was created. In this case, the founder believed that a, uh, a vision of a Buddha appeared on a plum tree uh, to present a scroll with all the information that he would need to transmit the school. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that he also spent several weeks up in a mountain not eating and uh, training vigorously before he saw this person. So in this case, his exact interpretation of the events may be up to so uh, may leave a little bit to the imagination. Okay, and um, it's referred to as uh, the founder as well uh, is the person in the is the the uh, illustration in the picture there is uh, Iyasasa Choisai Ieno. Um, the line of succession of the art continues through the Iyasasa family uh, to this day. Uh, so it, it is one long unbroken line continuing to, down through that family and transmitted downwards to its other various practitioners. I would not be so vain as to, as, as to try and convince people that I am a member of the Iyasasa family. Don't worry. It was created during a period known as the Sengoku Jidai, uh, known as the period of warring states. So this is a period when uh, Japan has been broken up into several warring fiefdoms, uh, when and different uh, daimyo and, and local lords are battling for the, the for the control of the entire country. Uh, as such, it is what is called a sogo bujutsu, which means a complete martial art. It contain it is supposed to contain all the elements of a of, of a martial art that is required to to defend yourself both on and off the battlefield. The line is currently uh, the line which I practice is tran was transmitted through a uh, a teacher known as Yoshio Sugino. Uh, there's a picture of him there in the top left-hand corner. And if you can see there beside him, uh, the, there's a guy holding a sword off, kind of off shot. That is uh, Toshiro Mifune. And they are on the scene of the film uh, Yojimbo, uh, which should hopefully ring some bells for people for people who have who watched a couple. It's, uh, it's one of Akira Kurosawa's great samurai films. And uh, you can see a couple of Katori Shintoryu techniques within that film. So what we aim to be talking about today is we're going to have a chat about, and I, it's not worth switching the camera, the camera on for it. We're going to examine the open air quotes, legendary weapon of the samurai, close air quotes. Uh, we're going to try to understand the, the battle space, the space that, where, where samurai were fighting within feudal Japan. OK, and within that space, there are particular ways with which uh, the the sword of the samurai would be able to be employed. OK, and we're going to talk about swords because swords are cool. And I imagine that you didn't come here because you wanted to talk about paper folding. So uh, moving swift, so I'm going to move swiftly on and I'm going to pose a very simple question for you. And if people have been to this talk, that talk before, they will they will be able to catch me out. But um, stick your anti, uh, answers on a postcard. Um, can you tell me what would you call that? What would you call that sword? I think we can. Can we? Can we see any answers? Or is there a way that we can? There are some chats coming in. Yeah. Tachi, tachi, katana, katana. Well, you stung me rapid. Okay, so usually the 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 response that we would get, uh, Tachi Uchigatana. Yeah, very good, excellent. Um, yeah, so a lot of people here, um, and I had a, I had a feeling that uh, Kaylin would 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 get this. 
Um, most people would be immediately inclined to respond with a katana. It is not a katana. Um, we can tell that it's not a katana because it is, uh, there are elements of the sword furnishings. So how the scabbard is decorated, uh, how the, the element, the decorations at the top and at the end that, that would make someone be inclined to think, oh, that's, that's not a katana. But the most important element is that if you see the way it hangs down with the blade pointing towards the ground, that is the first thing that should lead us to, to the conclusion that this is not a katana. Um, a katana is a shorter version of this and the tachi, which is a lot of what I will be showing you, is a more pragmatic sword for a more pragmatic era, okay? So, which, which is a nice way of saying it's for, it's a, uh, it's for more, shall we say, kind of brutal work, okay? Um, the tachi is a little longer, not quite as sharp, and, it's, and it has a more pronounced curve. Um, this means that it is more suitable for a person on horseback, um, but it also means that it is more suitable for a person fighting against somebody in armor. Okay, um, you can see there uh, one of the most one of the most major issues that we have to deal with is that a samurai sword is very very sharp, very easy, very easily able to cut someone, but if it comes into contact with another sword edge, the edge of the sword is so brittle that because it is so, so sharp, and especially if the other edge is, is, is as sharp as it is, it will cause the blade edge to chip. Okay, So this means that you don't get these like uh, wide sweeping uh, waving cuts or flashy, uh, flashing of steel because that's considered to be, that's considered to damage the sword which is a serious concern when you need that sword to kill your opponent, okay? So our, the prominent thing we need to be aware of while we're talking through uh, this, this presentation is how do we overcome, it's not how do we deal with the, the main feature of the, of the katana or the tachi, which is that they're exceptionally sharp, but how do we deal with one of its main flaws, one of its main, how do we work around the fact that if you want to cut some someone or something how are we going to overcome the fact that we may inherently damage the blade in the process so this is a demonstration between myself and my own teacher uh, joseph kennedy uh, in our dojo in kilkenny and i'm hoping it will give you a small idea of what we do Okay, so it's worth noting that within that cut, the swords don't necessarily get stopped. The sword came down, and my own sword and Joseph's sword, we did the same, we did the same technique back and forth a few times. You'll notice that the sword came down, but wasn't necessarily stopped. They came into, they came into contact. But at that stage, the sword was already continuing along its path. So where is the attack directed towards? I will admit that it does seem a little bit slow. And there are some oddities with how the person was actually cutting the opponent. If anyone, if anyone noticed that, right? And this is all, this is all part of how the martial art itself is. It, is trained. And the notion is that we are training in a suit of full yoroi. Um, so samurai armor, okay, which has its strengths and its weaknesses. Now, unfortunately, I've used this board. I, I don't know who the person here is that is wearing this armor, but he's very clearly, uh, he's very clearly wearing, uh, he's very clearly been shown how to put it on by somebody else, but that's okay because 
um, but, but that's okay because that means that he can, uh, it, it shows us where the weaknesses are, where the openings are. Okay, so if you have a look there, um, you can see his wrists are almost completely open. Also, his armpits are completely are open to attack. This uh, and the other problem is um, how precisely do I cut someone with the helmet that he is wearing? It's very expansive. It's very broad. It's very showy. And if I try to cut someone by raising the sword over my head, I'm definitely not going to knock my helmet off. Okay, so that'll be worthwhile considering when we move on to when we have a look at the next at the next couple of slides. Okay, or, or at the next or at the next couple of, of cuts. But we need to be aware of the fact that our sword is brittle, but also our opponent is wearing armor, but he's only wearing so much armor. Okay, and with any luck, this will give you a better idea of how one would overcome those, those issues. Okay, now I will be the first to admit that what you saw there was not the most exceptional Katori Shinto Ryu. Okay, but it's worth pointing out did everyone see the areas of the body that were being that, that were actually being targeted there? Okay, did we notice that I, we, were, we were either going straight for the head or it was either the hips or somewhere uh, along the line of the neck? But in general, it was always the same three or two or three areas that were being that were being persistently attacked. And those areas are obviously because if you go back to because there is a weakness there, I can either attack under the arms, attack under the arm, under the armpit. I can either attack toward the uh, attack up to his neck or I can catch I can try and catch his wrists. But in all those cases, that is because where there is a weakness. Now, if I'm cutting down towards the head, it is because I am making a very, very large, strong cut down to, towards the head. And that's what allows me that the ability to make that sort of powerful cut. Okay. Now, there are a whole range of other areas that are being attacked during this present, during that kata. OK, but in order for me to tell you where those areas are, I need to tell you a little secret. OK, so before I tell you a secret, I'll need you all to stand up and check under your seats for ninjas. Have you all done that? OK. There was no block. There were no blocks of parries demonstrated in that last counter. At no point did I attempt to stop the sword. Neither did the person I was demonstrating it with. There are no blocks or parries demonstrated in any of the katas that we would that I that we learn or that are being demonstrated here. Doesn't that seem a little bit counterintuitive? It seems a little bit, shall we say, out of sorts. So to get our heads around this, if you see any of the blocks that were demonstrated within that form, you'll notice that the guy's sword comes up at a particular angle. And I'm using this picture here as, as, as the best example, okay? 
But by the time that the sword has come up to block the sword, the guy, the person I am striking, uh, Chris here, this, in this case, uh, has moved completely out of the way. If he's moved completely out of the way, what do I need to block? And what's occurring here is, if you're in a 15th century uh, dojo teaching Katori Shintaru, you need to keep the secrets of your system hidden from people who want to come in and steal them off you. So what they've actually done is, they've, they've intentionally taught the first parts of the kata wrong. So in this case, this person here is not stepping back, they are stepping forward. And if they're stepping forward with that sword, if you were to visualize where that sword comes up as I cut down, you can now see where this is, where his sword is coming up as I strike down. Okay. This is not a block, this is an immediate counter attack as I attack my opponent. So with really good timing, I can catch my opponent as he cuts down on me with his sword. Hope again, this this will be illuminated maybe a little better here. Okay, so that video and that kata, that's kata number three of four that you learn as the basic forms of the system. Okay, those are the, you can, you can start to see how the attack is disguised as defense. How as the person is coming forward, you are rising, you are moving in precisely to meet them as they attack. Okay, this means that the system is in actual fact a lot is a much closer martial art than it initially appears. Where you see those people like pulling back, in actual fact, the two fighters are getting much, much closer to each other. And if you saw there, there were where the person is blocking overhead with the sword, that is kind of the range that you would expect to be working at a lot of the time, okay? Now, unfortunately, this means in order to be very good at this martial art, you need to be very good at timing, which means you obviously need to be doing it for a very long time which I don't consider myself to have been doing. Okay, so we'll move on to just one or one last element here. So beforehand, we had been going at a slightly slower pace. We're still going at a relatively slow pace. But in this case, this last kata shows what happens as you develop within the martial art. So too, your timing develops so too your ability to match your opponent develops, which means that over the course of this cat, you'll see the two of us doing much, much similar uh, actions as we attempt to basically match each other's timing. How successful we are in that is entirely up to yourself.
Now, so amongst the elements worth considering there is most of the uh, actions that you saw take place there. There are 10 or 15 elements there within that kata. We have a question. Okay. Uh, yes, actually, Keelan, yeah, Keel, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question. And I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name. Um, we'll answer that question shortly. Okay. Uh, it's an excellent question. And yes, we will answer it. Um, so the cat are intentionally made longer so that you have several elements of the, uh, so you're, you're going through multiple different scenarios, which is meant to be intentionally tiring. Most kata, for example, my other martial art, Jikishin Kagaryu, would include maybe two or three cuts between, between your opponent. You attack forward, you retreat maybe once or twice, and then you attack back, and then the cat is over. But in this case, we have attacked each other maybe 15 or 20 times. Now, the cat and themselves don't seem long, but they are nonetheless quite mentally draining if you keep doing them for, for a few hours at a time. Okay, The postures also are supposed to be longer. Everything here is uh, designed with the intention of wearing you out. Even the keikogi itself, the, the jacket, the stuff that we're wearing, is not sportswear. It's not designed to be comfortable. It's designed to be sweaty, and I can assure you sometimes it is. And this means that it's all meant to, it's all meant to be taxing, exhausting, so that when you've put on a full suit of your oi and you're prepared for an actual battle, it is not a surprise for you. And you're able to adapt to situations as they show up. So that being said, the swordsmanship is the first of one small step in the style. It's very much a sword art. But, it's, but the sword does more than just fight against another person armed with a sword because there are, there are many other weapons in the Japanese arsenal at the time. These include... So you would have sword, the staff. In this case, the, the staff doesn't seem like a battlefield weapon, but it's actually more than likely a spear with the head of the spear chopped off. And you're expected to defend yourself with the, with the shaft as a spear until you can get back and draw your sword. The naginata, which is the weapon I really do, which is a weapon I really like, which is a halberd with a curved blade on the end. The spear, uh, two swords. Uh, you are at some stage, learn, you will learn how to use uh, two swords. Uh, shuriken, so throwing darts. All of these weapons that you thought that maybe samurai, some people might think that samurai were too honorable for it, will get used. Uh, Jiu-jitsu is in there as well. And then the, the, the syllabus gets weird because there is gunnery. Uh, there was a firearm syllabus in Katori Shinto Ryu for a long time, but that, that part of the syllabus is no longer, it's, it's been lost, so it isn't taught anymore. Uh, there's a philosophy element. There are battle tactics. There's siege warfare, where to build a castle and how to attack a castle. Uh, counter espionage and anti-ninja tactics. Um, how to know when a ninja is trying to sneak into your castle. And then it gets even more weird. And then the last thing is that there is actually a magic syllabus in Katori Shintoryu, uh, where you write seals on pieces of paper and give them to people. Now, my, the reliable things I've heard is it, it's very much a, everyone I wrote will have one of these seals for, um, everyone I have ever written those seals for and I asked them for, they have stayed alive. So there's definitely, you know, there's, there's definitely some survivor bias in there. And uh, I've, I have yet to find uh, any information about being able to cast a fireball, but I will keep you posted on it. Okay. So the last element, and I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to cut too much into my time, is that uh, the samurai were not always wandering around wearing their full army looking for fights. And the nature of living for a fight or being a professional warrior class meant that they had nonetheless to be prepared for combat in almost any situation, especially one that arrived suddenly, especially when you are so focused on your own honor. For this, they have to be prepared to receive an attack suddenly and be able to draw their sword and counter attack as effectively as possible. For this, they create the art called Ei Jutsu, the art of drawing the sword. The essence of this is basically you must be able to draw and cut in one fluid motion, finish the 
uh, engagement by killing your opponent, remove the blade from your sword in a, in a uh, ceremonial fashion, and then sheath the sword. The form starts and ends with the sword inside the scabbard. Now, there are many styles of Iaijutsu with their own focuses and odyssey and little oddities. Katori Shintoryu has its own uh, form of uh, Iaijutsu, which you can see myself and uh, Sensei Joseph demonstrating there. I'm going to show you a couple of those elements here. Okay, and I'm going to discuss them, for which I apologize for any poor sound issues in the next couple of seconds. So. First part of the cat is usually, and I've chopped it down quite badly here, uh, wearing the sword or putting the sword on your belt. For this, there is a small amount of ritual. So at this stage, I am ready to defend myself with the sword. You will notice I'm sitting down. There's two reasons for this. One, the roof of this building is behind me. However, there are uh, the majority of the forms that you will learn on the entry level of Tori Shindori will be for defending yourself sitting down. Okay, can you do that? Yeah. Okay, cool. will be for defending myself sitting there. This does not mean I'm in a house. This means I'm defending myself usually in the dark when sitting down like this will change the horizon line on a figure that somebody would normally associate with, with a normal human being, and that will allow them to go and confuse them enough that I'll be able to draw them with a scenario. So the art concerns drawing, cutting, and ending the fight as quickly as possible. The first form is this. A low cut down to the feet, then once, twice, up, catching the opponent as he tries to put down my head, Cover. So in this case, I'm covering my opponent. So if he gets up, I can strike him with the koshira, the butt of the sword. Bring the sword up and then finish my opponent. That last element there is called chibori. It is the practice of cleaning blood off your sword. Now, if you notice there, I, what I did was spin the sword 360 degrees in my hands and shake it off like that. That's not a very clean, uh, good way of cleaning blood off your sword, and it is likely to make a horrendous mess. It's not so much to serve as an actual way to clean your sword, but more as a reminder to do it. It is also very important that in, or it's quite noticeable that in this art, as opposed to a lot of other arts where there is drawing of the sword, we sheet our sword quite slowly in camera. In others, they're constantly aware of things going on around. The reason for this is probably because in Katori Shintoryu, 
if you draw on your sword, your opponent has annoyed you enough that you are going to kill him. Which means that you are not going to put your sword back into the scabbard until he's dead. Which means you should be able to take as much time as you want, because if he's not dead, the sword is not going back in the scabbard. We will, I'll show you two more. I think I have time for two more, don't I? I should. Okay, so. Makazuki no Ken. That's a little more like the speed I would like to be able to do that. But again, it was it was not my sort of scan. I'm gonna translate it to the next bit as well. So, I think without further ado, I'll take a few more questions. Uh, I'm just going to stick my mic back in for just a second. Okay. Thank you so much, Aidan Sensei. And it was wonderful. Um, something I've never known and I've never been introduced to. And when you demonstrated, I thought the thought was coming up. <laughs> coming out of my screen. Um, so yes, I have um, two questions um, ready for you. Can you hear me? I can, yeah, just a second. Yeah. Take your time. Right. Yep. Now, two questions for me. OK, so the first one um, was from Kaylan. Um, interesting. During training, do you ever break down these movements and practice the execution of the techniques at this closer range? Oh, yes. Um, it depends. Uh, some schools, some schools will do uh, some schools will do that, and some schools will do it slightly more than others. Um, so uh, uh, another line called Otakeha. Uh, which is another line of Katori Shintaryu, um, would do it, would do it quite a lot. But if you saw the first movement where we were in there, okay, where we were demonstrating, uh, whoop, let me try and do this with this. So we would demonstrate like a couple of, uh, so where we would move back and then force our way back into the, uh, force our way back in on the opponent. We would break down the katas into their, into individual elements, but for the most part, we would, uh, we would tend to keep the same distance as that would, uh, the, the breakdown of the distance, so the getting closer to your opponent tends to come later with uh, the, secret kata um so the stuff that you are not supposed to see demonstrated until or the stuff you are not supposed to learn until after you've made a literal blood oath not to share secrets with other people um please note i have not made my blood oath yet so unfortunately i don't have any ninja secrets to tell you sorry <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yes. Um, two questions coming from Julia San. Um, yeah. So, first one is How long did you train before you are allowed to use a sword? I, are you, if you're referring to uh, this sword here, so this is, uh, this is an Ito, so it's actually blunt. Um, and with good reason. Um, I have trained with a, with a Shinken, so uh, a sharp sword. Um, like, 
realistically, as soon as depending on the play on on the school that you want to join, depend they will tell you when and where you want to you should get a, a sword sharp or otherwise. Um, I once upon a time told myself that I was not going to get a sharp sword until I had reached a certain level. And then someone just basically gave one to me. Um, so I would be inclined to think, don't buy the tools or get the tools that you need to practice the art and don't go any further than that. Um, like your, if your sensei knows what he's talking about, then common sense should mean that he will uh, stop you from doing. He will stop you from going out spending very a large amount of money on a sword that is going to just do you an injury. Um, it's also worth pointing out, and I feel this is this this is a good time to mention this. Any sword that you see hanging outside, hanging in a in a like in a sports shop or something like that, or or if you see, um, you know the. Uh, you know the uh, what are they uh, it's like the likes of the martial arts shops or, or places like that? Any of the shops that you see hanging on a wall outside there are basically just for that hanging on a wall. They're lit they're not even tempered, so if you try and cut something, they'll probably just break, snap, and send a piece of steel flying off in some direction to injure someone. So um, get into the sword out first, and then talk to your sensei. Your teacher will tell you when is a good time to start looking at buying an actual sword. Um, for the EI Jutsu element of it, for the sword drawing element, it's great to have a metal sword. But honestly, for your first, for your, for the first part of your training, for the first year or two, you just need a metal one. You, you just need a piece of wood. That's that. That's all you need. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. And before moving to the second question from Julia San, can I ask you a question? Very basic yeah, question. Yeah. But yeah. how did you find um, EI Dawn? How did you find Katori Sintoryu? Um, oh wow! The, um, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, this 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 prince had to kiss a lot of frogs before he found his princess. Um, within, um, I basically trawled my way around assorted social media and things like that until I found until I found someone, and I had to go to a lot of things until eventually I found um, something where where the questions that I asked had legitimate answers as opposed to the kind, like a, a lot of the answers that I'd been given previously were like, that sounds like the kind of thing they would do in a film. That's not really like a, all of the swordsmanship that you see in films is, is, is not right. Um, so if it sounds like it came out of a, if it sounds like it came out of an action film, the odds are it's not right. It's not correct. Um, so for myself, like when I went out for it, I searched through a lot of people and I met uh, Joe and I met the people in Katori Shintaru and it was actually, it was more important. It was the fact that they were just interested in training the art and not looking for memberships, money, uh, <laughs> like fancy uniforms, stuff like that. When you find someone like that, you know they're more interested in the art than just like making a name for themselves. And that's, that's, that's the best information. That's that's the best advice I could give you. Find someone who doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies, and it will it will usually like get better from there. Thank you. I was just wondering all along, yeah. and yeah. I only know Katori Shintoryu is kind of intangible cultural property. Like, yes, in, in, in it Japan, is. But um, yeah. that's the only information I had before. Yeah. It's it's yeah. I I love that. Uh, it's it's been basically marked as. Uh, an intangible cultural asset or really important, but nonetheless non-physical element of Japanese culture or, is, or specific to a particular province. So that kind of shows how uh, important uh, yes. it is. Yeah. Uh, what sort of training did I do? Did, did you do to get to this level? Um, I just like, honestly, I did the same thing that I've done in Naganata and I've done in every good Koryu that I've done uh, since then. Uh, since then, which is the same thing over and over and over and over again. Uh, you'll get, you will get, uh, you'll start with a couple of very core, simple elements. You practice those until you feel comfortable with those. And then you just, and, and then you just do, do the same thing over, over and over again. Gatori Shintaru up to a uh, showdown level is four sword katas, uh, four staff katas and two Naganata kata and technically 
you should be able to do, you, you should be like, you should get a, like a black belt once you know those. But um, if you're not a, like realistically, you should be training for many, many years before anyone is, is a, should, would turn around to you and say, see that guy there, that guy knows what he's talking about. Because there's so much more to it than just two people swinging swords at each other or sticks in my case. Um, you will notice as well that we're dead, we're, nobody uses steel swords when they're training with another person please don't do that it's really dangerous um i'm not encouraging anything to do if blunt or blunt or a uh, sharp doesn't matter don't do it you'll wreck you'll wreck your swords use a stick they literally grow on trees use a uh, get a bucket um thank you and another question um is coming from chris um to what extent are principles of tactics strategy embodied in the kata are these related to broader or more widely Ooh, applicable really strategies good question that i don't have much of it honestly there's there's a lot to interpret within the uh within the kata i like to think of it as um, you'll notice that there's some there's 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 certain elements of battlefield awareness within the katas, right? In particular, in the first kata, you will notice that uh, the uh, one of the people basically drops to one knee. Um, the reason for this is you need to be able to prepare for when you trip over a dead guy and you and you fall on the ground. For for which you don't want to be the guy mm -hmm. who falls on the ground and goes. Oh dear, what do I do now? You want to be the person, you want to be the, the, the guy who goes, oh right, I appear to be on the ground, but that's okay. Now I have now I have a now I have a solution to this. And like I said before, um that's not a parry, that is person cu person cutting upwards. I am bringing the sword right up to here underneath his armpits and then driving upwards to uh, cut back to his hip or behind his leg. So, again, very good question. I think in terms of, like, does it's it's a really good and it's a really broad question. I think there are certain elements of battlefield tactics, especially in the in the fourth kata, where you are attempting to match your opponent, get into their own get into their own pace, and in that way get into their own thought process and in that way beat them all of the great generals that i have known have been masters of getting into their opponents heads okay but to be honest i think uh that could be reading into into it a little too much um the uh katori a lot of the great katori shinto ryu teachers including otaka sensei uh read heavily into the likes of um sun tzu um, and while I have a great appreciation for Sun Tzu, it is nonetheless 53 pages long and containing like some very rudimentary elements of tactics like, you know, attack strength, attack weakness and defend against strength. Well, if you if, if you have to be told that you really shouldn't be wearing a general's hat now, should you? Um, so. It's, it, it's a it's a very broad question and. Yes, there are elements of battlefield awareness and strategy, but they're quite broad. Um, I don't. I, I. I think they lose meaning as as yeah, as you work your way up the chain. I hope that answers the question for you. Okay. Uh, um, and um, do you have any other connections with Japan or Japanese culture or history outside uh, of? Sword Outside of this, outside of this, among the, and and my strange martial arts, I don't yet. <laughs> uh, is um, obviously my the, the other connection is that, that I have is that I would be I, I, doing my best to make sure I'm a, I'm making myself available for the likes of Experience Japan and and, and uh, things like that. Um, my other martial art is uh, has a much like strong. I've got a much stronger link to the heads of the of, of the system, um, but that means I have to be a little more defensive about who i show it to um they're a little bit more protective about who gets shown uh how to do this particular type of naganata um but otherwise uh my my interest in in japanese culture is i mean i'm i'm a dab hand at origami when, I, when i'm left to it um but 
otherwise I have not even been to Japan yet. That is that is that is still on my bucket list. But there's a, there's going to be a lot of very angry uh, sword teachers who are going to be asking for uh, who are going to be wondering who left this Irish guy into the country uh, when I, when I get there. And where do you practice in Ireland? And you mentioned you sometimes go to Europe. Yes. Yeah. And is Belgium the Mecca, yeah. the center of? Yeah. Um, so uh, Belgium. Uh, so Switzerland is where uh, is the center of my particular line, I suppose, of Katori Shintoryu. That's where my sensei's sensei uh, uh, practices. Um, and uh, I, it's, it's, my sensei lives in Kilkenny. I travel there as often as I possibly can, it takes about an hour and a half. Um, and yet we'll, we'll basically go through as much as we can to make sure, to make sure we're ready to, uh, like, I'm gonna start, start building our own knowledge as we go there. Um, but Kenny's also quite nice because it's Kilkenny and it's not Dublin. So uh, it, it, it gets me out of the city. Um, <laughs> um, it's quite scenic is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Belgium is where I practice uh, Naganata. Um, that is where a, uh, she is, um, uh, she's very, fairly highly ranked within, uh, the system of Naganata that I do. Um, they're, they are an official branch. Um, it's a system called Jikishin Kagariyu Naganata Jutsu. Um, and I, I would love to talk about it more, but I would wind up just talking your ear off. Uh, it's just, it. It's like it's one of the few arts that it has a it's, it's a very uh, swift, fast, uh, powerful martial art. But by comparison, but it's 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 quite different from the Naganata that you would see with, that you eventually learn when you when you do a uh, Katori Shintaru. And I don't have a Naganata with me and I don't think I'd have the space to actually do it or I'd wind up knocking <laughs> out a light bulb. Um, so that's. <laughs> Uh, that's that's yeah. uh that, well thank you someday i will manage yeah here comes another question from naginata practitioner kaylan okay. um oh, so yeah. you talked about naginata kata did you find it a difficult weapon to learn i feel like you really need to use your entire body to wield it oh uh, depends on which naginata you are talking about so for katori shintaru the naginata is is a good bit easier than Jikishin Kagaryu. Um, for, so for Katori Shintaru, um, the stance is a little more forgiving um, and you're holding the weapon in thirds. It's actually a much longer Naganata as well. And the, the Katori Naganata is two and a half meters long. So it's a proper battlefield pole arm. Um, for uh, Jikishin Kagaryu, it's only 195, but it's, uh, you like, you want to be in proper warrior pose for doing Jikishin Kagaryu Naganata. So you have to have your butt cheeks tucked in, um, your, your beer got sucked in, um, and your shoulders aligned properly all the way down the line. So it's, if you're doing it properly, like it, it, as, as one of my old teachers in jiu-jitsu from years back once told me, if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. Um, so the posture is really, really hard. And again, that posture is a big part of it um yeah and yeah you do need to you need to use your whole body in order to use it in particular um uh and this the, the, one of the things training with a mask has really has really wrecked is that you need to use your voice when you're doing uh naganata because it's a big element of driving your opponent back or assessing like dominance as a fight is using really powerful ki to be, to, to help you when forcing them back and giving you the distance that you need to to fight with your naganata um i think keelan you would you probably do uh i'm assuming you do atarashi naganata um which takes a couple of elements i think it takes a couple of elements from obviously from uh jikishin kagaryu um but again jikishin kagaryu your opponent is most often uh, somebody armed with a sword which means that if the person with the sword gets inside the distance of the of the naganata you are in trouble so you need to use your voice and you need to use your presence and power to keep driving them back and to give you the distance that you need to swing the naganata now uh julia yes, okay. said yeah. the modern sports from of yeah. 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 yes okay. which 
is which is great and it and it's probably a lot better exercise than me just basically swinging an agonata on my on my own in my back garden but again there are the, there are those differences uh did yes. julia have a question no i think it's she thanks us you, okay, you gotcha. basically yeah so i think our time is up but thank you so much Shane and sensei and it's been wonderful and you gave us um lots of I mean, in generosity, you're being very generous um, with taking those questions and answering and slides as well with lots of information. And then you demonstrate it um, for us. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. So, and also, I'd like to thank uh, Mr.